Hi, I'm Martin Koster. I currently maintain the uh, official Docker solar image. In this presentation, I'll give a quick tour of the project. Why would you want to run solar under Docker? Well, you can run solar in a single step uh, without having to worry about all the requirements like downloading solar itself, installing Java and, and so on. Um, and it is uh, very fast. After the initial pull, it takes like 20 se uh, 12 seconds to start solar. Um, and runs the same way under Linux, OS X and Windows, which is all very nice. Uh, Docker containment allows you to install isolated instances in separate containers running on the same host, which can be very handy. The Docker ecosystem has got uh, lots of features um, that are useful for structuring your application, like uh, Docker volumes, networks and so on. And we're trying to make our image easily extended through Docker files and uh, volume mounting of scripts, which we'll see later. You can get solar uh, by doing a Docker pool or by going to Kitematic and searching for solar. It's on uh, Docker Hub, that's the link in the middle there. And it uh, is uh, on GitHub, uh, that's where our source code lives. So I'll give a quick Demo, let's see. Here we do a Docker run of the solar image. Um, we say please map port 8983 on the host to 8983 in the container, uh, run in the background, and we'll call this container demo1. So if we then see it is actually running and we can open the corresponding URL and we should find ourselves with a running solar. So that's very nice. But there's no course available here, so that uh, is a bit boring. So let's see if we can fix that. We'll kill the existing demo and we'll try the second example here. So what's different here, other than the name, is that we say uh, we specifically want version uh, 6.4 of Solar. Um, that's just so that you know that that's possible. And we're passing a actual command to the uh, image. Previously, we just specified Solar, which is the name of the image, and it defaulted to run Solar. Now we're saying, actually, execute Solar demo. If we then look at the logs, Starting at the top, we see that um, Solar is starting. We're creating a demo core. Then we're loading example data. This is data that ships with Solar itself. And then we shut down Solar again was that uh, we started in, in the background, did the loading, shut down the background solar, and now we're restarting it to run in the foreground so that we get the actual solar log in the Docker log, which is handy. So if we now go and look, we should see the same Docker solar, uh, solar admin, but this time we have a core selector menu. How Exciting. So if we go to the demo core and we do a query, you see that data has in fact been loaded and Solar is running and raring to go. So it's all great. And again, we can easily get rid of it again. Okay. The example at the bottom there um, is the same again, but this time we're passing a dash E solar heap equals 800 meg. Um, this shows how you can use environment variables to set values that traditionally used to be set in the solar config.sh.in. Um, this makes a lot more sense for uh, the Docker use case. So if you start Solar uh, and you want to create a core for your own data, how can you do that? Well, you can uh, pre-create cores or create cores. What's the difference? In the Solar Create case, we start up Solar in the background. We use the built-in Solar commands to create the core. And then we shut 
the background solar down and start it up again in the foreground. So this is uh, supported by um, the solar project itself, so it's nice and stable, uh, but it's a bit of a faff. The second way around is to say we're using the solar pre-create command. What that does is before starting solar, it will actually copy a directory on disk so it's in the right place, so that when solar starts, it will see it and use it. Um, so I tend to prefer that method. Of course, once you have yourself a, a core, you can then um, store that in the volume and pass that to uh, further instances without having to recreate it each time. And that can be useful, especially if you want to uh, test uh, the same example data over and over again, for example. So let's have a look at Docker volumes. Here I create a volume called Solar Vol 1 and I then pass that with a dash V to um, mount it in the container on slash opt solar server solar my course that my course is just a directory name um, we've actually created it in the uh, in the container uh, itself in the docker file and here we just mount our volume on top of it so now when solar pre-create uh, creates my core one it will do so in that directory and therefore in the volume so now if you kill your container uh, destroy it and start a new one pass this volume uh, your data will still be there you can do the same thing with host directories um, here we just make a uh, directory called my cores in the local file system uh, of the docker host uh, chone it appropriately and then we pass it to docker run again in the same way this time, if you kill that uh, container, the, uh, your local directory will contain your data. You can wrap all this up in a Docker Compose file. So here we see uh, we have one volume defined at the bottom called data. We have uh, one service defined at the top called solar, which is the solar image running on with a, a, the specified port mapping there uh, using the the volume mounting that we did from the command line before and we're running uh, solar pre-create to create the core. Here we have a slightly more exciting example. Let's actually try this out. First we create a docker network on a specific IP range. Then I run Zookeeper and I specify it to have an IP address in that range. Uh, this one ends in 10. You see this is actually not our Zookeeper. This is just uh, one that is available on the Docker Hub. Now we're going to run a solar container, again specifying an IP address, and we're telling it where the Zookeeper is. So that was our first node. We do the same again with our second node. Uh, we'll give it a minute to start up and then what we'll do is we'll run the create collection command by actually executing inside the first solar container. Uh, you can do this from a separate uh, container too. But okay, so this actually produces output and shows you it's creating a new collection. Good. Once that is done, we see the result, it's done it. And if we go look, we see the collection is in fact here. Yay. And we see that if we look at the cloud configuration, we have our two nodes, uh, our two shards for our single collection. Good. Again, you can get rid of everything fairly easily. All gone. Right, so what's under the hood? If you look at uh, our GitHub repository, um, what you see is this. We have a readme and a Docker FAQ with instructions for use. We have two template files, uh, one, one standard Docker file and one for Alpine, which is a, a, a trimmed down um, Docker image that uh, um, is available for the OpenJDK and uh, makes it uh, quicker to download, I suppose. So we provide our, our images for both 
the normal and the alpine variants. There is a scripts directory. It contains things like the solar demo command that we executed earlier, and we'll have a closer look at what's in there in a minute. Uh, the three numbered directories there are the versions that we're currently supporting. Inside each of those, uh, you'll find a copy of the Docker file and a copy of the scripts directory. And in an Alpine subdirectory, again, a Docker file and the scripts directory. So basically the way this works is we modify the templates uh, and the top level scripts directory if we want to change something. And then I run the update.sh command at the bottom, which then copies it uh, into the uh, number directories that we have there. Uh, the reason we do it this way is that the Docker Hub build process uh, wants it that way. If we want to build a, a 6.4 uh, and a 6.3, this is how you, how you provide that. So let's have a look at the Docker file. Um, we start with OpenJDK. We uh, do an apt update and install LSOF, because that's used by the um, Solar uh, Startup uh, script in some circumstances. Uh, we define the Solar UID uh, to be 8983, which is of course the same as the default Solar port. That's just so I only have to remember a single number. I still forget that. Um, and then we define where the key server lives and where we're going to download um, our artifact. Uh, you see those checksum goes here and fingerprint goes here uh, phrases. They will be uh, replaced by the actual versions that we're, we're dealing with by the update.sh command. Here's the actual meat of the Docker file. Uh, we create the directory we're going to use to install this. We download solar. Um, we verify its uh, checksum. We verify its GPG signature. Then we do the installation. Um, then uh, we copy our scripts directory, show them the whole thing so that it's owned by the, uh, the Solar user, uh, set a path, expose the, the port that Solar listens on, set a work directory, and we declare the default command to be Solar foreground so that if you don't specify a command, it will run Solar in the foreground. That's it. In the scripts directory, you'll see those uh, solar create demo foreground and pre-create uh, commands that you've uh, uh, us seen us use earlier. The other scripts that are in this directory uh, you can use to make your own custom scripts. Let's look at one of them. So this is the solar demo one. Uh, you see we have a sentinel file so that we can uh, skip the creation and data loading um, after it's already happened once, right? So if you stop and start your container, we can skip that work. Uh, first time around though, we start local solar, which starts solar in the background. We create the core and load the data. Uh, then we stop solar, touch the Sentinel file and proceed to run solar in the foreground, which is of course what you saw happen in the, uh, the log output in the demo earlier. There are two ways that you can uh, extend um, this, uh, this mechanism to do your own um, scripted uh, use cases. Uh, one way is to use a custom Docker file where you inherit from our image and you just write your own custom script that you add to the image. Um, but you don't even need to do that. You can just mount such a script from the host directory uh, or you know one of your volumes, I suppose, uh, into the appropriate place in your Docker volume and then run it that way. We also have an uh, older mechanism for um, getting into the startup sequence, basically. If you provide a script in the location shown there, that will get run before we start Solar. So you could um, you know, create a core there or do configuration changes there or what have you. But I kind of prefer doing it as, a, as an explicit uh, script like we saw previously. So let's talk about how change happens in this repository. What are we actually trying to do? We're trying to make it easier for novice users to try Solar on Docker, um, while allowing advanced users to use our building blocks for their own custom configurations. Uh, we try to keep up to date with both new upstream versions and bug reports and, and so on that happen uh, on our GitHub project uh, site. Uh, and a non-goal at the bottom there. Um, what we don't want to do is add lots of extra functionality on top of Solar. Um, 
we want to follow the upstream as, uh, as closely as we can so that the, the maintenance stays, uh, stays sane, basically. I started this um, repository in 2013 under my uh, own username on, on GitHub and then moved it to a separate organization um, such that if I get hit by a bus, there are others who can take over ownership fairly straightforwardly. Um, I've done most of the uh, development work. Uh, Shalin uh, has been helping me uh, get some, one or two of the releases out, which has been great. Um, I've had more participations from users as well recently. Uh, David Smiley has been participating with uh, some interesting use cases and um, ended up making some changes in the upstream solar contribution to, uh, to better support what we're trying to do, which was great. Uh, Tobias uh, Michelson sent in a, a bug fix for something I'd broken, which was very much appreciated. On the Docker library side, uh, Tianon has been assisting with code reviews and merges, which has been a great help. And of course, uh, Lucidworks supports my work on this project. Without that support, I would be looking to hand over this responsibility to someone else. So if you like Docker Solar, tell Lucidworks. Now our development pipeline is um, a little uh, mess of arrows, yes. What you see on the left-hand side is uh, changes coming in from Solar and changing coming in, changes coming in as pull requests in our own repository for like new features or bug reports or whatever. So they get into our Docker Solar repository um, as branches. We have a Travis um, setup that will automatically build and uh, do some basic testing of the master branch and of PRs that, uh, that come in. It uh, will, for the master branch, actually uh, publish the resulting Docker images uh, to Docker Hub under the name Docker Solar slash Docker Dash Solar, so that you can try images before they hit the official images repository for testing. When we are happy that uh, we should roll our latest and greatest into the official images, we make a pull request in the Docker library official images re repo and then the maintainers there will uh, review our changes, see what we've been up to, and then incorporate that into the official version. And when that is, has been merged into their master, that gets built and produces the Docker Hub image called Solar. Right, so in our project, what do we want to do next? Well, um, I'm pretty happy with the state of the code as it is at the moment, but what we need uh, a lot more of are better docs. Um, newer versions of uh, Docker have added new capabilities and we've learned one or two things and we've changed our code in one or two ways such that the, uh, the FAQ and our README may need some, uh, some updates. Um, and I would like to see documentation for uh, more advanced configurations like using it with Swarm Kubernetes, uh, using it with Calico, um, I want to have a, uh, a page describing best practices for going into production, worrying about um, you know, your security, like what ports do you uh, open up, where and how, uh, what cleanup do you need to do, like uh, Zookeeper uh, snapshots that need regular maintenance, uh, how do you deal uh, with logging of multiple containers. Uh, we've talked about the IP addresses some already. and. Uh, if you use virtual networks, then how do you actually proxy into those or expose ports inside them to get access to your application? Uh, what are the, the best ways of doing that if you want to apply access control? And lastly, uh, Docker recently introduced Docker stacks and distributed application bundles. Um, I'm not entirely sure what they are. They look like a, a more advanced version of Docker Compose in a way. Uh, to define your whole stack and it, uh, I'm sure that that is something that we could use for Docker Solar to um, show off how it uh, works with uh, client applications. Uh, what else? Uh, we could do with some more tests. We test that uh, we can start Solar and that we can uh, index data into it and search the resulting data, uh, but we don't explicitly check every command that we support um, or any of the uh, uh, extensible um, mechanisms that we've provided. So it'd uh, be good to get uh, get some more tests in place there. 
the reason I'm having this talk here now is so that uh, other solar committers and, and folks can get more awareness of this project and sort of how it operates, uh, what we're about. Um, I would like to see some uh, nicer demos of solar features within Docker. Um, we've seen how you can start a solar server fairly straightforwardly. Well, it'd be nice to uh, have a, a equally simple start uh, of some uh, graphical user interfaces or, or client code that then talks to those solar instances to do something useful. I think that uh, will be appreciated by users as well because it may give them a leg up in their own applications. Um, uh, we may consider at some point making our own Zookeeper image as well uh, if that becomes required as a result of the, the documentation that I talked about um, on the previous slide. Right, so that's about it. If you have any questions, um, go to our uh, project page and um, you know add, a, add an issue there and I'm sure somebody will, will respond or hit me up direct. And um, that's it. <laughs>